head turned now if you wish. I can hear me. <laughs> oh no, not me. Okay, I'm told you can hear me, right? <clears throat> Good deal. Well, we have a few seats empty tonight, but not as many as I expected. A lot of people are gone, <clears throat> and there are people visiting with us. We're glad you're here this evening. <clears throat> We're going to talk about the animals tonight. Remember that? But I've improved the lesson since last week a lot. I worked all afternoon on it may not get to that part. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> let's begin our class now with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the blessings that you provide for us. We're thankful for opportunities we have to study your word. And we thank you for those who've come this evening to engage in this study. We pray that we will be uh, our knowledge of scripture will be improved, that this will help us to understand other, perhaps in some ways, more important text of scripture. And so we ask you to bless each person as we listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good to see each of you, really. Anybody bothered with allergies? I keep getting worse every day. But this is not my natural voice. So anyway, it's always bad. You never know what it's going to be. We're going to talk about the animals of the Bible land, some of them at least, tonight. And we're going to start with one of the very popular ones, the donkey. The donkey is mentioned lots of times in the Bible. And I can't guarantee you that this donkey was ever in the Bible. <laughs> but... There were a lot, of, a lot of ones that are mentioned. And uh, you see in this particular picture, which is made uh, just inside the territory that is near Gibeon. I showed you a picture of Gibeon from uh, a site where you can see it from kind of a hilltop. And uh, I had a driver one time that I was asking to take me to that place, and he thought you could just go right across the field here. Uh, really, you run into all kinds of problems when you try to make a personal trip, you know, not already planned by the guides and everything. So I told him, you can't go this way. But we got that far. And uh, after just a little bit, he decided, no, you can't go this way. So then he took off, and I told him how to go up Highway 60. And he decided he'd go another way. He went out toward Tel Aviv and then took a turn in, came to the gate, and they said, no, you have to have a permit in advance to come through here. So there we were. I said, go Highway 60. Eventually we got there. Eventually we did. And uh, this is what I find a lot. I find that uh, there are drivers, had it happen last March when Leon and I were there, and we told him where the place was that we were going. And uh, it was Terza, where the first capital of the kingdom of Israel was located after they were at Shechem. And they went out to Terza and built a capital. Then after that, they went from there to uh, Samaria. And he just headed off the wrong direction. I said, this is not correct. I didn't know exactly because it had been some years since I'd been there, but I knew it was not right. So anyway, eventually, we spent 45 minutes of our time. We were paying him, mind you. And so finally, we got there. Finally, we got there. But anyway, here's a good donkey. If you need a good ride somewhere, there's your fella. Now, the donkey was used for transportation and cargo in those days. In Genesis 22, you remember that Abraham, when he went to obey the Lord to take Isaac to Mount Moriah, that he saddled a donkey. And it said, each man 
that went with him. This is another text in Genesis 44 that each man that went down into Egypt to recover Joseph, that each person loaded his donkey with goods. Well, he had to have goods for himself as he made his trip, you see. And then also they were taking gifts to the man, the Egyptians, regarding Joseph. So that was a rather significant thing that they did. This is, I'll show you just several pictures of donkeys. And of course today people have them all dolled up with the nice looking uh, saddles and so on. And that's what you have here, this one at Petra in Jordan. And uh, there's always somebody wanting you to ride the donkey. And of course you have to pay a good sizable amount to do that unless it's something that's included in your trip, which usually is horses for a portion of the trip. The donkey was used for the uh, transportation and cargo. And this is the story of Jesse. And he took a donkey and he loaded it with a bread, with bread, a jug of wine, a young goat, and he sent them to Saul by David, his son. So this is when they're going down to the battle at the Valley of Elah. And he loads up all of the things that they would be needing during the fight with the Philistines. So they used it for that purpose. The donkey was valuable to them. Our animals are valuable to us, especially if we're farmers. It's really, they're really valuable to us. Now they are precious to us if, we, if they're, they're pets. But if you live on a farm, you've got to keep those animals healthy. And the same was true here. So they were so valuable that God said in the commandments, you shall not covet your neighbor's donkey. Did you ever notice that? You're not to covet his property. You're not to covet his wife. You're not to cover, covet his donkey. Because that's something that he needs for his livelihood. And that would be taking that livelihood away from him. And in Proverbs 26 and verse 3, there is a statement made with regard to uh, punishment. A whip is for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the back of fools. So God is saying there is a way that you take care of the donkey. You do care for them. You put a bridle on them in order that they may do the work that you want them to do. There are interesting little pieces. I found this one from Syria that was in the Bible Land Museum. The Bible Land Museum is a museum that is, was a private museum. There was a gentleman in Jerusalem who had amassed quite a collection of uh, artifacts from all over the Middle East. And uh, he, when I don't know if he did this, how, how much if he left it in his will or if he did it before he died, but he left this all to the state of Israel and they built the Bible Land Museum, which is next door to the Israel Museum which is also across the street from the Knesset building, which is like our Congress, our Capitol building in this country. And <clears throat> so this is one of the items that he, he had there from Syria. And it dates back as early as 1800 to 2000 years before Christ, the Bronze Age. It is bronze. And uh, it shows the animal and the man riding on the animal. And this is the same kind of figure that you might find when you find figures of Baal. Baal is always presented as one who is holding up a hand like this. And if there won't be anything in it, because it was usually made of, I guess, wood. And so it has a hole like this where the spear was. And he was the god of thunder. He was the god of war, the god of weather. And so he could give you good crops, bad crops, etc. You see, and he would be ready to thrust that against the enemy. 
So those were the, the idols, and if we get around to talking about the gods they had, we'll be talking about that as well at some point. Women rode donkeys. You might think, well, they didn't, but they did. In 1 Samuel 25, 20, it said it came about that Abigail was riding on her donkey and coming down by the hidden part of the mountain that behold, David and his men were coming down toward her. So she met them. Do you remember her husband? Nabal, he was the guy who was the fool. That's what his name meant. And he didn't act very well. And so she doesn't want David's men to come and start a fight there because she knows it will turn out bad for him or her husband. So she really fixes a meal for these people. Talk about a pitch-in. I don't know, what, what do you call them down here? Pitch-in? Potluck. Yeah. Well, whatever they called them back then, that's what she was fixing. And so she gets everything ready for this whole army of people. How many people did he have with him? I'm not sure. At one point, he had 600 300 of them were so tired, that was at Besor, 300 were so tired he left them and took 300 to go to continue his work of defending himself against Saul. So you can see that it was quite some thing to have all these uh, men coming here and uh, she has prepared all this food, has lots of donkeys and she puts them on them and takes them out, which I would say she probably had lots of servants as well that were helping her. And in Egypt, I see these pictures like this. This is a woman who is pulling the ox along, and she's riding the donkey, and she has her shopping bags with her, all those things. She's been down to the public store. I, I may have said that wrong. <coughs> Now also, it said that you're to work on six days, but on the seventh day you shall cease from labor, right? That wasn't a bad system, was it? No. We go play ball on the seventh day, right? We, we stay busy every day. But God thought it was good for man to have a day of rest. And that has nothing to do with our worship period, you see, that's Sunday, the Lord's Day. But anyway, it says that in order that your ox, you'll cease from labor so that your ox and your donkey may find rest. It almost looks like he's more interested in the ox and the donkey than he is in them. You've got to give your animals rest. And so you need to do that. You have to grease your tractor and you have to give your animals rest. And that's what God wanted them to do. That was a sign of prosperity also because when we read about Jacob, he became exceedingly prosperous and he had large flocks and female and male servants and camels and donkeys. All of these things, these animals that we're going to talk about. And when they go to try to recover Joseph, it says, then the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water, and they washed their feet, and he gave them their donkeys fodder. So not only do they take care of the people, they take care of the animals. That's just part of what you do to show hospitality when somebody comes your way. And this is not something you need to see, because you saw it a lot last week, right? The olive press. So we'll go ahead and skip that, but you see that the donkey this is a new point. The donkey is pushing this, pulling this around, and that's the way the olives are crushed. And so they were used in various purposes. It may be, a lot of us think that the book of Job is probably one of the earliest books of the Bible, that he did live during the patriarchal period. And so it tells us about his possessions. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men of the East. 
That's a lot of animals. I have an uncle. I didn't know this till four years ago <clears throat> that he had a farm. I knew he had a farm. And I knew he had cattle. But I didn't know he had 500 head of cattle. I'm not in his will. <laughs> it would be nice. And he took me out to see the calves, the, you know, the new calves that were coming. And I said, how many do you have a year? About a hundred. He could probably have more than that. And so you just imagine this with 500 female donkeys, how many don little donkeys you'd have for sale to the neighbors. And that would be quite a bit. And then, of course, all of these to use yourself for the purposes that you need. And Moses, read about him. He took his wife and his sons and they had them ride on a donkey. This is after he'd been over into Midian. And he went back to the land of Egypt and Moses took the staff of God in his hand. So he puts them on the animals. They all go back and he begins his work for the Lord as the one who's going to be the prophet of God or he's going to be the spokesman and Aaron is going to be his prophet. When the children of Israel returned from, when the Judeans returned from uh, captivity, from exile, this would be the Babylonian exile, it tells us that they brought back 6,720 donkeys from Egypt, I mean from uh, Babylon. Think about that, 6,700. Do you remember the first lesson or two we talked about how many days it would be, how, many, how long it would take to go? How long was it? To come back from Babylon, how long did it take to get to Judea? What is that noise? No, the first question is the one I'm waiting to answer. <laughs> It took them four months. The Bible ex tells you exactly. It took four months to walk or ride your animal that distance. We think about taking a trip. And we think, well, I just have ten days. I just have a week. I just have the weekend. We get on the plane, go, come back, say, yeah, I had a great time. And here they are going back home. And it's going to be four months traveling time on donkeys. And so, not something that I really would care to get involved in, I think. Now, Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem on a donkey. And this was very important. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse 5, it says, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a burden of beast. A lot of different translations there. It sounds like it's two animals that are with him. He's riding one, and there's the little colt that is going along. And we see scenes like that today. This is at uh, Nazareth Village. So we have a white one here, and then we have the small one, the, the uh, little donkey. And uh, that would be the sort of situation you would find with Jesus. The people take down all of the palm branches and things of that sort. And you do find those around Jerusalem, but you find them more in the Jordan Valley. So he's come that direction. And no doubt many of the people have come that way as well. And so they would have these palm branches that they would uh, put there uh, as he came into the city of Jerusalem. Here's another example showing us a different color of animal where there are two of them together. And they also plowed with the donkeys. I've mentioned that, of course, but uh, here's an example of it. This is near Bethlehem, and this individual has a field that is plowed, and now he's plowing it, getting it. It's been plowed somehow or the other, and now he's working it again, you see, around the edges. And... Uh, you can see he just has this small patch that is there. There's something else here that we have not yet talked about, but you may remember finding this example in the Bible of something of this kind, and it is right here. What's that on the corner there? Hmm? 
it's a boundary marker. So you see that the field is just full of rocks, little rocks. The edges of the field out there has lots of rock. I mean, you couldn't even plant there. Now, if you're scattering the seed, like we will talk about, the sower went forth to sow, and some fell upon the rocks. Well, they're not going to produce anything, are they? So there's the on the edge, but that's what will happen as we sow the seed. Uh, they will be some on the rock, and uh, there is the boundary. You see quite a bit, few of these in various places. And then also in the Babylonian world, and there are a lot of these in museums, they had boundary stones that were really special made. In other words, it's like having your own boundary markers made. Somebody, in, you know, takes almost like making a tombstone, and you put that in the corner so you have your land. And you see these a lot of times between fields, indicating that one farmer has this one, another farmer has the other, and that is the way they are used. So here's a closer view of the gentleman working. Has an ox, uh, rather not an ox, but has a uh, donkey pulling his plow. Uh, here's some friends that uh, just happened to meet near the Pool of Siloam in Jerusalem. And uh, you can see here that uh, one stays on his donkey. He's only one of them's on the donkey. And he comes along and they start talking. And they were there for quite a while. I watched them this a long time ago, that picture. Another of the animals is the mule. And when you come to the mule, they are burden bearers. In First Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 39, it says they were there. That was in Hebron with David three days, eating and drinking, for their kinsmen had prepared for them. Boy, they had a big feast. So they were there three days eating because all these people had prepared for them that they would have all of these things. And then in First Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 40, it said, Moreover, those who were near to them, even as far as Issachar, that's the tribe, and Zebulun, these are up Naphtali, that's up in the north near Galilee, and these people brought food on donkeys, camels, mules, and on oxen, great quantities of flour cakes, fig cakes, Look at the foods again. We've talked about the foods. Look at them here again. Flour cakes. What's that made from? Wheat or barley. All right, and then fig cakes. What's that made from? You're so smart. <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I can't trick this group. And then he says, in addition to that, you have bunches of raisins. There's the vineyard. And you have also wine, that's the vineyard, a little later on. And you have oil, what tree is that? Olive tree. Then you have oxen and sheep, there's your meat occasionally. And there was joy indeed in Israel. So talk about having the things that you need for a real party. That was nice. And uh, that's the way it was in those days. Here's a man plowing with a mule in Samaria, I think. I had a picture I showed you. My picture was not very good, but it, I believe it's the same place that Todd Boland has made this one. And uh, he's plowing with a mule there. And he's plowing among the trees, but you see they will also plant the wheat or the barley in that little area there. So you plow it, put the crops there, and that would be something that would be nice. We have this even used in prophetic language, like in Isaiah 2 and verse 4, talking about the kingdom. It says, and they will hammer their swords into plowshares. In other words, there won't be war in the kingdom of God, but there will be peace there. That's what God intends that it should be. And so this plow is at Neot Kedumim. 
but you'll find these numerous places uh, as antiques, sometimes in shops, sometimes in restaurants where they'll have them decorating the wall, and then sometime in museums. And so this amounts to an outdoor museum and a good illustration of that. And you remember what Jesus said about that? He said, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So you don't start to work for him and then turn around and go the other direction. You've got to keep going when you start working for him. I used this on the blog several years ago and I had somebody wrote me and said something like, uh, uh, why are you people putting so much emphasis on the land? Well, it was important. God gave it to Israel. He gave that land to them. And so that's one thing that's important about it, but that's not the point. The point is, Jesus is teaching a lesson using that illustration that they knew. You see, we use illustrations we know. And they used illustrations they knew. We ought to use more that they used. And we need to understand this a little bit better. You know what I'm saying? And therefore, we would have plenty of illustrations to use. And all of our lower class Bible teachers ought to have this course. We need to get y'all out of here at the end of the quarter, get them in here, but I won't be here. <laughs> but one of you can teach it. And they need to understand these illustrations because who needs to start learning these little illustrations? The little kids do. They need it badly. So they grow up and their Bible is something they say, well, that's what they did in Bible times. See? And then it makes it sensible to understand that. Okay, let's go to the oxen. What about the oxen? Don't be unequally yoked. In Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10, it says, You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. Why is that? Hmm? One's really stronger than the other. And so it wouldn't work out too well. It wouldn't be very good. But that's used specifically by Paul in an analogy in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. And what does he, how does he apply that illustration? Marriage. Marriage, you don't, you're not, can't be unequally yoked. You get one person who's a believer and one person who's an unbeliever, and that is not an equal yoke. It is an unequal yoke. And so they can't pull together properly. It will not work. So don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers also, specifically Paul says, uh, in the New King James has it rendered that way. Uh, later on, maybe we'll have yokes in here. I've forgotten whether they're, they're in this lesson or we'll do them some other time. But there is one right there. Now, I have never seen this in my visits in the, in the Bible lands. But this photograph I bought way back, 69, from a company called Wolf Worldwide somewhere in the West, in California, I think. And uh, it was said to have been made there. And you see that they've got the yoke that's tying the two animals together. I mean, you, you, you hook them to that. We use uh, bridles and so on today in our society. Uh, and if we're used, still using the animals. But uh, I assume that picture was authentic. Uh, the company seemed to be reliable and all that. And now here's a picture from Egypt that I have seen. And here's where you have two oxen together. It looks like to me that the one on this side is a stronger, larger animal, but maybe not. It's hard to see the other one. And you see again the same kind of wooden plow, probably with a steel or iron point that is doing the plowing and the animals are pulling and the man's following along there. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit in a, in a little while, hopefully tonight, about 
the overlap of the workers. What do you see in this picture that doesn't go with planting grain? What? Threshing. Threshing is at the end of the season, right? So, you've got threshing and you've got plowing for the next what? Next planting. Okay, keep that in mind. We're going to come to something more about that. And here it is. Look at this reference. The plowman shall overtake the reaper. It says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountains shall dip sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel. This is talking about returning from the captivity. Amos is the prophet. I mean, he's way before it happened. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel. They shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. They shall take gar make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land. I'll plant the people on their land. See, they're in captivity. They're going to be in Assyria and then Babylon, and they're going to come back, and God's going to plant them on the land, and he says, they will never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. Okay, look again. Jesus taught this same thing. He said, do you not know? This is in Samaria, Jacob's well. He said, do you not know there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? The disciples have been into town. Remember, they went in to get food. What's he been doing? What? Talking to the woman at the well. Not only talking to her, but what? Teaching her. He was teaching her by talking. He was teaching her that there was one place that God had in the future for them to worship. And that was wherever they were. Neither in this place nor in Jerusalem. But God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so he says to them, don't say it's four months till the harvest. Now we could put that down and figure out probably when he's there. Because what? Let's assume he's talking about wheat or barley. We know when it comes due, when it's ripe. Right? So maybe I didn't try to refigure it. I figured it in the past. Maybe it's December. Maybe it's, you know, don't say they're four months. And then comes the harvest because what? He says the harvest, the fields are already white under harvest. I remember hearing preachers say when they were going to preach overseas somewhere, the fields are white under harvest. And then somebody else would say, well, how many workers have been over there? Well, none so far, but I'm going. But that wouldn't, won't work, will it? You've got to have seed planted first before the fields are white under harvest. So somebody has to go and plant seed. So in this situation, the disciples went in to buy food and Jesus is teaching this woman, therefore the seed has been planted. Don't say there are four months and then comes the harvest, for he says, behold, we have this situation. I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that a sower and a reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true. And who does he quote? One sows and another reaps. Who's he quoting? 
Did I not mention that prophet? Who said the plowman shall overtake the reaper? Amos. See? So Jesus is referring to this. And so he says, you have this situation. The saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Now, you can take that further as I know you have in other situations and you've thought about it yourself. What really happens in the overall history of the church? After they preach the gospel at Pentecost in Jerusalem and Judea, then they go to Samaria. And so where had he, lay, had he planted the seed? When that woman left him, what did she do? She went back into the city and told them all the things that Jesus had said to her. Now you have several teachers who are spreading the word. See how it works? And so this is exactly what he's talking about here. The plowman overtakes the reaper. And this is in Amos as it explains the way this is going to happen. And you see it, Jesus using the same illustration. Beautiful illustration. Now, is that what happened? Indeed it is. I'll come, maybe I've got pictures of that. The plowman shall overtake the reaper, a common agricultural event applied to the return of the Jews from captivity. Amos is from Tekoa. It's just south of Jerusalem, 10 miles. It is a little bit southwest, or pardon me, southeast of uh, Bethlehem. And so he's prophesying at 760 to 750 B.C. They don't go into captivity. The Assyrians don't come and take them away until, what is it, uh, 710? And you don't go into Judea until 536. Or, or No, I'm sorry, that's wrong, 586. And then you start returning uh, to Judea in 536. Joshua and Zerubbabel come back. Then in 458, Ezra comes back. In 444, Nehemiah comes back. It's just God had all this planned. This is the way he was going to bring these people back. And they were going to come back because this would be true. So now what do you have here? The plowman has overtaken what? It's an illustration of it. That's the way the Lord's work, plan worked for returning his people. And look at this illustration that I found. This is in Jordan. This is near the Jordan Valley. There's a town called Dur Allah. And inland from that just a little bit, I saw this scene. And it just was overwhelming to me when I saw it. I thought, wow, look at this. I'm out here driving around find, trying to find beautiful things to photograph and illustrations to teach. And here's one of them. What do you see out here? Yeah, there's unharvested grain right there. It looks like some of this might be already cut and piled up. I can't tell that for sure, and I don't remember. But then what do you have over here? There's the plowman. And what is happening? Up there is grain still growing. So the plowman has overtaken the reaper. This is exactly what Amos said. It is what you see in the case of Jesus also in the illustration that he used. There's the picture now. Now what do you see real clearly out there in the field? You see it looks like ready to do what? The winnowing. Ready to do the thrashing and the, and the winnowing. See? And then you see the ground. Even with the rock in it, that's where they plant. You can see that the plowman is going to be working there. In, I don't see this scene. I've only seen it this one time. This is at Lystra. 
Paul was at Lystra. And what is this guy doing? He's scattering the seed. See, the seed, that's how some falls on the rock, some falls on good soil, some falls, falls on you know, the lessons that we've studied about that. All right, look at that. See the greenery? You see how it's going up above his head? That's the tell of Lystra. That's the mound of Lystra. That's where Paul preached. That's the city. There. Today there's a little village nearby around it. But that was the city. It's buried. There's been no archaeological work done there. You may hear a lot about archaeology and you may think, boy, they just couldn't be anything left. <laughs> there could be 95% left because there's so much to do. In Israel, there are probably 5% of the work's been done, maybe 10 at the most. Uh, go over into Turkey, they have 11 hundred archaeological sites. Many of them are known in the Bible. And there's so much to do. So we expect this would be happening, wouldn't we? And so this man, what have they done up the side of the tail? They're planting their seed. And every time they plow, what comes out of the soil? Pottery. Pieces of pottery. Ancient world. The ancient life comes out of there and we learn about those things and so that's rather interesting that it's that way that we get this information these men were standing by the side of the field and we really stopped to see the scene there and to talk to them and I'll tell you an interesting little story I get calls people say where is there a church in so and so my daughter's going over to school she's already there this is Saturday night, I know. But can you tell me where there's a church she can attend? I got one that one night from a brother said, my son's going to Paris. When's that? Well, he's already there. I looked at my watch. It's already 7 in Paris this morning. You're just now calling about where can he go to church? Yep. Isn't that funny? I've taken a job in North X, wherever. Do you know of a church there? Why are we like that? Wouldn't the first thing be, is there a church in that town? And if not, what will I do? Can I start one? Okay, so I told you that so you know it's not so different back then and now. I said, this guy didn't speak English. I told the guide, I said, ask him if he knows about the Apostle Paul. All right, got it? Paul preached here. So the guide asked him. And I want to tell you, I didn't get it, probably. It was the funniest look came on his face. And then he spoke. And I said to the guy, what did he say? He said, no, but you might check the next village. Isn't that sad? And you could do the same thing in Jerusalem. You could do the same thing in Rome. You could do the same thing in Antioch. See? A lot of us think that because we've got a church here in every city, and that's not true, of course, even, that surely there'd be churches in all these places where these people used to preach. But no, there's not. But isn't that a sad story? That's one of the saddest that I've heard in my visits there. Captives from Lachish. How did they get from there, from Lachish, all the way to Assyria? That's the way it's portrayed 
on the relief that was left by Sennacherib on his, in, his, in his palace. And that's just a, an iron work of it showing there. There it is. That's what he left on his palace walls. And I'll, while we're here, I'll just show you some of these other things. Look at these people that didn't get to go away into captivity. They're being impaled. That's when they drive a big long stick through your whole body. And that's what they're doing there. So here's the couple up here. They've got some sacks of grain. They've got to eat for four months to get there. And here they are, and Dad's walking. Or maybe he's a servant that got free. And the oxen is pulling, the, pulling it. So these are the animals, and this is what they did, and so on. Now there's your good yoke. That's a gentleman on the, right on the border between Turkey and Iran. And he never would look around at me. He looked to see, you know, what I was doing. And when he saw I was making pictures, he didn't want his picture made. And so there we have. And what did Jesus use? How did he use that illustration? Take my yoke upon you. Don't be unequally yoked, but do what? Take the yoke of the Lord, be yoked with Him, and so on. So, we will talk about, we'll pick up there next time, and continue. And uh, thank you for being here this evening. I appreciate your presence very much. You can use it now. It means you're